question posed to me, can you make it pretty for us? Someone laughed, I, I know you've been there too. <laughs> and so I think, uh, I think uh, what graphic designers do really boils down to the idea of attention. <clears throat> Getting people to pay attention to your work, to have some meaningful interaction with it, and to really um, leave with a strong message. And so I, I wanted to pull you guys, I was curious, um, because there has been a lot of research on it, but you guys can blurt it out. What do you think the average human attention span is? How long do you think someone can pay attention to something before they zone out? 15 seconds, great guess, you're so close. Anything else? Four seconds. Four seconds? You've listened to me longer than that. <laughs> Thank you for that, by the way. So, it's kind of crazy, uh, a few years ago, Microsoft Canada came out with some research that changed marketing and design. They said the average human attention span is only eight seconds. That is insane. Um, they also added insult to injury by saying the average goldfish's attention span is nine seconds. So, sorry. <laughs> but this was kind of crazy knowledge. Um, it really impacted marketing and design in particular because all of a sudden, instead of creating um, meaningful content that people can interact with over a long period of time, um, both fields started pumping out content that could be easily digested. We have eight seconds and we need to make it work, so let's make it flashy, let's make it pretty, let's make it quick and easy, and that is how we will get our audience to pay attention to us. Now, I've worked in design for a while now, and that hurts me. <laughs> um, and, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, when you're designing for an eight-second attention span, you're designing um, for a human that doesn't exist. And this is why. That's not real. Um, this, this article that came out about the eight-second attention span, it was actually disproven. Um, what they found is that Humans don't have an eight-second attention span, and I will show you why. Raise your hand if you've ever binge-watched anything on Netflix. Yeah, I thought so. We can pay attention to things for more than eight seconds. People do it every day. Um, I know people who spend an entire weekend playing video games, and they don't get bored of it. I know people who do that with books. Um, people pay attention to things for longer than eight seconds when they are interested in it. People pay attention to things when it's content they really care about. And then, um, just to add on to that, a bunch of goldfish experts actually broke down the goldfish thing, too. Apparently, their attention spans are longer than nine seconds, so everyone lost. <laughs> so what we did find um, when that was finally debunked, uh, BBC News and a few other pretty reputable sources came out and said, you know, people's attention spans aren't shrinking. Um, people aren't losing attention in everything. Um, and I think that's something that we just kind of picked up with this idea that technology rots your brain. You know, you can only pay attention to one thing at a time and you can only focus for such a short period of time. Um, and, and we find that's just not true. So this selectivity um, means that people don't pay attention to something for a long period of time if they're completely disinterested in it. The, one of the things that goes along with that is that people's brains aren't, they, they don't move that quick, quickly through it. Um, basically, we've become better at processing information. So we've become better, become better at saying, I know I'll be interested in this. I know I'll be interested in that. This is coming from something I care about. So one of the thing that, things that's related to this you know, idea of technology changing the way our brains work is how we interact with content. Um, so uh, some 
extra studies were done that were related to the original BBC study, and what they found is that people are more selective about content nowadays. Um, they're looking for content that they know is worth their time and worth their effort at looking at. They're only going to spend eight seconds with your work if they don't have a reason to care about it at all. We also find that they're more focused on intriguing content. Um, people want to be entertained. They want that rush of dopamine when they're interacting with their, your work. They want to see something they actually care about. And they're also more likely to wait for content to come to them. This one, I, I think, is um, they might want to do a little more research on because I know people who are very impatient about the content they consume. But uh, what they mean there is that uh, people get excited about things that they know are coming out. Um, they're more willing to put in time and effort to something that they know is going to be a fulfilling experience for them. So the key to modern engagement isn't getting people to pay attention for eight seconds and hoping they stick with you. That's just not it. Um, and it, w when you interact or, or make people interact with your content like that, you're really missing the point. The point is how can we tell a story knowing that people are selective about their content, um, knowing that this is a choose your modern attention span because we don't have to pay attention to what's just in front of us. We can pay attention to whatever we want. So I think the more important thing is finding what's your hook for your content? Why should someone care at all? And then pitching that to them through your design, through your marketing, through your advertising. So all this boils down to is really understanding attention, understanding the marketplace for it, and understanding your audience. So I think uh, where the making it pretty idea comes from is superficial attention. That's what people think graphic design is. They think it's make it flashy because then people will pay attention to us. And hopefully they'll stick. I don't know. That'd be nice. But the superficial attention is only the bare of your piece that you're trying to use to catch their attention. It's the purely cosmetic element. And if you're designing content for someone, um, say I'm designing an email marketing campaign, I can make my piece as flashy and pretty as I want. But like Keith brought up, I work in insurance staffing. No one's looking for a pretty piece. No one's looking for flashy elements. They will close that email if they see a bunch of flowers animated and a bunch of graphics. They'll leave because they don't think, my company's qualified to talk about anything if we don't understand that core bit of them. Which leads us to content attention. Um, this is how someone interacts with and retains information about what you're trying to tell them. So in that scenario, I would be trying to tell them, hi, we work in insurance. We can find you a job in insurance. I want them to leave with that knowledge and not the knowledge that I learned how to make a bunch of pretty graphics of flowers in Photoshop. That's more important to my audience. The core content attention, my brand, and the information that's most relevant to them. And good design communicates that, not that their designer is really good at art. And so one of the best ways you can go about finding you know, what your audience is interested in um, and finding what really sticks with them is doing some heavy research. I'm um, a nerd, but also a really big fan of designers doing some research into their audience. This can look a few different ways, but um, for me, I do email marketing campaigns, so I personally look through those open rates, those click-through rates, I want to know how my audience is interacting with my work. If I included a graphic in there, I want to know that they actually care about the graphic um, and that it's changing the way they interact with our piece. And the, uh, I included a, a quote here from the University of Michi uh, Michigan um, Graphic Design Advisory Program because I think it's really great. Um, 
basically they're saying um, you want to make sure your message is the right message for your audience. You don't want to include that flowery graphic if you know your audience is going to be turned off by it. And that's where communication design comes in. This is making sure that you are actively participating with your audience, understand them, and are working to achieve communication goals for them. And there are quite a few ways to do this, and I'll um, go into them here. First of all, any questions so far? I know this is a lot of research for nine in the morning, so I want to make sure I can you know, uh, answer any questions that you have as we go. Yes? That's a great question, um, because most graphic designers aren't doing the content. They're not writing their own copy, unless something went wrong. Um, <laughs> I've been there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I think one of the most important things is finding that balance. So one, making sure that the design and the art you use is relevant for your audience. And also, I'm a big fan of working with your copywriter. I ask a lot of questions. It's probably really annoying. But at the end of the day, what I get is, one, what are we looking at doing with this piece? Like, are we trying to get people to engage with it? Is it just for branding's sake so they see our name? Um, because at the end of the day, you want to know what's the purpose of that? Why did we write this? Why are we sending this to someone? Um, so I think it's really important to strike the balance between those two, between the content and how you're showing the content through your design. Does that help a little bit? Okay, great. Any other questions while we're going? Great, well feel free to shout them out. Um, I'm happy to make this you know, a full on discussion because I, I think it's important. So um, the best way to learn how to communicate people is by learning about your audience and learning about your skill set. Um, and so I have some suggestions for you know, improving your communication skills. So, the first one is something I've personally really struggled with um, because I am a firm believer that I'm always right and I'm consistently finding that I'm usually not. Um, but it's so important to request feedback. Um, it's so important to ask people, what do you take away with this? Because sometimes you are so far removed from your audience that you don't understand that they're reading something totally different into it. Um, and I'm a big believer that you don't just ask the top of the food chain, what's wrong with this? It's great to interact with other designers and say, how can I make this better? But ultimately, like, think about your audience. Are you showing this to anyone in your intended audience? For me, it's, am I showing this to anyone in insurance? If I'm not, then maybe I'm missing something really drastic. You know, maybe I don't understand that um, this graphic doesn't make sense for this field. I do this all the time. Um, one of the big things in insurance is there's a lot of uh, nurses. And so I used so many graphics to appeal to our nurses that were like stethoscopes and doctor's robes. And guess what? Insurance nurses work administrative jobs. They will never wear a stethoscope. It is completely unrelated. And so I had to cut that because I was told, you know, this doesn't mean anything to them. And so learning things like that are really important. And I think it's so vital that you ask for help sometimes because you will never learn that on your own. You'll never learn that in a vacuum. It's also really important to consider the users. So how are they supposed to interact with this? Like I mentioned with you, how is some, what is someone supposed to take away from this? You know, you have your copy sometimes, what are they supposed to learn? What are you supposed to highlight in that? You know, what should they take away at the end of the day? And then in the same vein, it's so important to learn the design language. So you can have all the skills in the world and have all the good intentions, 
but if you don't know how to point someone in the right direction, at, point them at the content that you need them to look at, or get them to focus on the one thing that they should be taking away from this, it's really going to make the rest of this process hard. Um, oh, thank you. So things like contrast and white space and, and incorporating balance into your work are all very vital um, because it helps tie in together those elements and helps you really interact with an audience. And nowadays, when it's important that your content is substantial and rewarding and gives someone a reason to pay attention to it, you want to make sure that your design reflects that. You want to make sure that your design doesn't undercut the message you're trying to send. And then learn something new. I can't say every day because people are busy, but learn something new as often as you can. <clears throat> Failure in this industry is so important. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're not failing at something, you're not learning anything new. And I really think it's important to you know, learn a different type of art, learn how other people express themselves, learn how to express yourself differently. That can really be helpful for you as you expand in your design role, um, in your communications role, um, advertising. It's so vital that you continue to learn because that really, really helps you through this process. Oh, well that wasn't supposed to happen, but I think uh, finding a new hobby and learning how to fail at something can really be beneficial. And then I included a quote here because I think it's, uh, I think it's really important. So, Styles come and go, um, but good design is a language. So those pretty elements you may be thinking about including, they're really vital, they're really important, but there's a time and place for it. And making sure that your design speaks volumes about your content and really shows off your content, that is more valuable than the flowery graphics you can include in something. Making sure that you are actively promoting what you're supposed to, or promoting things that are important is really vital for this. My clicker stopped working. Um, <laughs> but with that, do we have any other questions? I wanted to thank you all so much for coming and um, letting me speak on this today. I wanted to open it up um, for questions so that you can all, so we can have a discussion about it. Yes, um, thank you for asking that. Um, I just picked up the violin, and I do not recommend it. It's a very expensive hobby, yeah. but, <laughs> but I'm a big stickler about trying different things, and so that has really helped my brain adapt to a totally different challenge. Um, and so I, I really, uh, I've been really enjoying that. I've also been dabbling in UX design, um, specifically app-related. I don't know what I'm doing yet, but I am learning, and that is the important part. Thank you, though. Yeah, um, let me think. I've had a few. So insurance is an interesting field, and we've had some competitors accidentally send me their email marketing campaigns. And the worst one is when you understand your audience a little too well, which is, a, you'll rarely run into that, but um, I've gotten ads for insurance companies that have, um, specifically around Halloween, will say, oh, you know what's spooky? If you don't have life insurance. And that makes sense for the audience, right? They're like, oh yeah, great, I need life insurance. But for the rest of us to get that, it's like, excuse me, <laughs> this is a terrible thing to just send to someone. And so um, I think understanding your audience and understanding like what's a little too far and what could be a faux pas is
spill. Um, and it varies industry to industry, but that's one that I've specifically seen um, in insurance. I'm trying to think if I've gotten any other weird ones, but um, I think uh, one of the things that's made a big difference is um, recently we've been A-B testing some of our sends and found that uh, emails with graphics um, that include like a button in it do extremely well with our audience. They like to know where to click. Um, and so things like that can really help you go from um, my audience is slightly interacting with me but doesn't really know where to go from here. Uh, they don't know how to fully interact with our content and that gives you the opportunity to take it to the next level. Like uh, they want to interact, we'll give them that push and show them how. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I know there's a lot of studies on subject lines specifically, so people just won't open it if it's too long or looks spammy. Um, what I find is that if you go below the fold for an email, that's usually where you start, when, when you pull those stats, that's usually when people are skimming. Um, the, our, our software pings like, they went through this in five seconds, there's no way they read it. Um, and so I think once you have a message that's so long that you're trying to communicate all of that in the email, um, I think that is when you make sure your email is above the fold. Do you know what I mean by above the fold? Yeah, so no one's scrolling down. Um, once you include things below it, they're probably not going to see it. So I think, I think that's um, one of the bigger things, but I, I would have to look into the full research, but that's, that's what we found. Yes. Hi, Jane. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the work environment in the work consumer partners, uh, and then copywriter partnership? Mm -hmm. like, how does your office setup work? Yeah, so I work in a now seven person marketing department. So we have a content lead, a secondary content person, um, two designers. Uh, one's more photography based, and then I do more of our general design and presentation work. Um, and then we have uh, two marketing leads and I am missing someone. <laughs> oh, and we have a marketing assistant um, that helps out with everything. So, so primarily we have two copywriters, two designers, and then um, uh, two managers and one overall assistant. And I find like uh, that small team is a really nice for collaborative, uh, quick brainstorming, that kind of thing. Great. Yes. I'm a creative repair in the realm of thinking out feedback. Great. Yes. I'd love to hear it. That's great, yes. I'm going to have to start saying that. Move to the pain. I love that, yeah. I would, I would also expand on that, like, become new at something. Like, start at the bottom somewhere, because that's... One, it's going to help you connect with people who are learning something new, um, and it reminds you that you have a long ways to go, um, and it, it pushes you to keep learning, and I really love that. Um, I think having, finding a, a non-art related hobby, or especially with an art related hobby, that can, that can really help you expand as a designer. Great, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a struggle, I think, in most markets. And, and now that everything's so digital, like with things like email marketing campaigns and, and presentations, you know, we're not just competing with Chicago. We're competing everywhere. Um, but uh, for a lot of our print work or things you would just see at a conference or an engagement, um, yeah, I, I feel like we're in a good space because 
uh, insurance overall has a real struggle, love-hate relationship with design. Um, <clears throat> you get a lot of places still that say, oh, we don't need that. Like, <laughs> it's just making it pretty, right? Um, and so I, I think we really don't struggle with that too much. We, we push ourselves to do better because they're, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't think we struggle with it too much, but it's something we're aware of and, you know, constantly try and uh, be better about. And, yeah. I hope that answered your question. It's, it's a weird uh, niche market. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, perfect. How was it for you coming from an art degree to working in marketing for insurance? I bet there's students who are not expecting they'd end up in such a, a technical realm of design. Yes. Well, I hate to say that I kind of thrived because um, I'm a really, at heart, a very corporate designer. Um, I like having a really strong brand, and I. Um, I really like creating a lot of on-brand work um, instead of like a small amount of really, really, uh, I don't want to say creative work, but we have like a really strong brand and a lot of professionalism in it. And so there's something really nice about having that background. Um, but yeah, I think um, for very, very creative types, it can be a, a tough role, especially just in corporate graphic design in general, um, because you are part of a marketing team and it's it doesn't have the, uh, creativity brainstorming that, say, like a startup would have. Um, but it's definitely something like I, I think people can get used to, and I've gotten used to. Um, yes? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You mentioned requesting feedback mm -hmm. from your clients or your, who you're marketing to as opposed to just your peers. Um, when you when you say that, are you picturing this more on like a personal level or a one-on-one, -on -one, or is this something that's happening in the masses? And that kind of leads into this question. So if you're promoting, go ahead and review me, go ahead and do these things that they lend themselves to like Yelp or these like Google reviews and stuff like that. And I think most of us would agree that that is not a very effective well, maybe not effective is the right word, but not a very representational. Um, Yelp reviews in general. I, I'm not sure what you mean with the, like the. Yeah. The so, online reviews from uh, a client or. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, do you think it's effective to be promoting that to um, the masses? Maybe somebody who doesn't oh, understand you your mean. field or anything say, mm -hmm. "Hey, review me," and then you're going to get your people, you know, behind the computer. Is that really effective, or is it constructive, or? Do you yeah, picture this so, happening more one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, I see what you mean. So that's a really good point. Um, there is a certain element of being too open with your audience uh, when you're learning. Um, one good concerned about, if you're concerned about uh, your audience getting, giving you negative feedback too early for something you're just testing, um, find a way to A-B test it, you know? Try something on a few of your clients. Um, uh, for me, it's email marketing, right? Um, I send a few versions of an email to some of our clients. I send a few versions that's slightly different um, and see how people react. And that way you're not dealing with the negative feedback of rolling something out and be like, everyone, let us know if you like it. Like, we're not sure. Um, because that gives you the professionalism to learn from it without going all in and getting a bunch of negative reviews for something you weren't sure about. Um, is that what you meant? Does that? Do, that's one way of handling it. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe it's just a different scenario because yours is specifically email marketing. But mm -hmm. I guess I'm like in a small business situation. Maybe you're a restaurant. Maybe you're a jeweler. Whatever the case, um, to make yourself open to criticism from the public or from your clientele, um, I found that to be uh, it can kind of be a double-edged sword. Like. You're asking for reviews. Hey, I mean, how often do you see that <clears throat> at an establishment? You like us? Go review us. Go to they're, they're prompting mm -hmm. people to yeah. interact. But do you think that that is? Um, do you see any negatives in that, or do you think that is a, a positive way to re to receive interaction or feedback? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think 
One, I think uh, you shouldn't necess necessarily stagnate with your marketing because <clears throat> you're worried about negative feedback. And I do understand that with a business it can be, especially with a small business, it can really make or break you if you have negative re reviews. Um, but I think um, things like negative reviews you wouldn't necessarily get from trying small tweaks and designs on things. Um, it would really, my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't own a small business, but uh, my understanding is that if you're making small tweaks to see how people react to things, um, they wouldn't necessarily leave you a terrible review on Yelp, or they wouldn't say, um, maybe if you had really drastically bad copy, um, that might be uh, more of a concern, but yeah, I think, uh, it's doing small things to find out how you can be slightly better about your market. Um, and if you think that interacting with your clients in that way is a really bad move, do not do it. You know, I'm not going to tell you to do it if you think it's against your own best interest. But then if that doesn't work, you know, who can you reach out to to get feedback um, before you send that out, before you post uh, posters somewhere? Um, I think it's really vital to get feedback. So if it's not directly from that audience, um, find something similar. You know, um, I'm, for some of my work, I, I can't send it directly to people at the conferences we go to, but I can at least pull aside the people in my company who go to that conference and say, does this match what they do? Like, does this look way out of scope for us? Um, and so even if it's not directly that audience, you can get someone related to that to tell you like, yeah, that looks good, or no, this is not that audience at all. Yeah, and it, I don't think going all in on something is a great idea either. So small tweaks, you know, small adjustments to find how you can be slightly closer to your audience. Don't spook them, you know, don't send something crazy and just see how they react. It's, it's all about those small tweaks, yeah. Yeah, so we use a few different um, research options. Uh, one is like our in-software A-B testing it's a godsend. Um, it lets us know exactly where our clients are looking, clicking, um, what catches their attention, and where they click after that. Um, but yeah, um, we also use, I don't remember the name of it, it it's a, a, an alternative version of um, the Google heat map software on our website, so we know where people are going. Um, but that's, that's how I do my research. Um, because we can see exactly where, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really helpful. And then we also do uh, surveys, but um, they're for a variety of different things. So yeah, it, it's helpful, but not quite as helpful as seeing exactly where they're looking. So thank you. I just wanted to contribute to the last comment that was made yeah. about the small business. Um, putting together your thought of doing the small tweaks and sending some to them and some to them. Mm -hmm. It might be cool to do like a few, um, like when you have different events lined up or something like that to be able to try out like a different campaign for each and it kind of feels like a high stake situation because it's this event, but see how one goes versus the other based on that campaign strategy. Um, and then also like if it was in Marquette, put a bunch of stuff in you know, one side of town and then a different sort of, you know, tweaked campaign on the other side of town and be able to try and figure out like, oh, where are you coming from or where did you hear about us? So it's that way a little bit more conversational and not like, where did you hear from me, you know? <laughs> I love um, that. That's a nice take on the, the yeah. A-B testing for something physical. You know, that's yeah. great. Um, Feels a little bit more personal for the community, I guess, small town. Yeah. Are we, do we promote these um, platforms for review? Does that, maybe that's a little bit better way so, of. So what do you mean when you say platform? Maybe I can. Yelp, Google reviews, Facebook mm -hmm. reviews, because in our experience, um, they're not very representational of the yeah, people. It, it we all be. know the people who are filling those out and that it's a very skewed perspective. 
of, uh, of it's a business. It's usually people who are dissatisfied. Correct. Yeah, it's tough. And so I, I just thought maybe you had some statistics or experience with, because I know businesses that go out of their way to promote these interactions where they're saying, hey, go review us. Mm -hmm. And we've, I've kind of always thought that that felt counterintuitive, that you're like, you know what? <laughs> if you're only going on there to gripe, why would I promote that you do that? Cause yeah, so I don't have research in my back pocket on that, but I think my understanding is you're trying to even out those dissatisfied customers, right? So you're trying to say, if you had a good experience with us, please go check this out, go do this for us, because it will even out the one guy who was angry the one time because he had to wait five minutes. Um, that's my understanding. Um, that way you're telling your customers like, hey, support us, you know, keep us going, balance out the negative criticism that's a little unfair. Um, so I think that's probably a great strategy. I, it might depend on industry. I have photographer friends that do it and they have great results because everyone loves getting their photos back from a photo shoot. It's like no one's, rarely people are dissatisfied. So they're like, you know, leave this good review for me now while you're on that high. And so it could be finding a, a better time to bring that up. Um, if you're worried about someone having a negative experience, maybe catch them early, like, hey, don't forget to leave us a review. Um, I, I think the, w one of the examples of this that I don't love is, um, and I can't remember the name of the site, but there's a, a design learning and art learning site that I've used before that uh, after you take a five minute lesson, it makes you leave a review and it is perfect marketing for them because everyone's excited after the first five minutes of a 30 hour course. Like you're not going to get any bad reviews because you haven't done anything yet. Um, so maybe finding a good way of doing that, introducing someone early to that idea of, hey, I know we've had um, a good early talk about this. Can you leave us a review? And, maybe see if that works better for you. Maybe your audience research is finding out when you should ask someone to leave a review. Try a few different things and see if you get better reviews from people or if you catch them at a better time. But. Also very true. It's worth getting them and then trying to type a, a reaction to the negative ones to prove that you are that maybe they're wrong or how you will prove um, that they were right. And you know, I mean, I think it's worth getting all the good ones because yeah. it's really good use of some of the the people to talk about that we are private and like you only recommend it and, and the prevention really <laughs> Thanks. Yes, hi. Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I have a lot of thoughts on all of this, but like, Great. Dan, Jeremy Simon's latest picture of your trout is like huge marketing for you. I mean, just that whole 
all of those kind of things are like really super duper important. They're unpaid kind of advertising that you get from, from good customers. So then you just plant those good customers constantly and then that spreads the, 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 the branches of the tree. But what I'm most intrigued about with social media marketing is the whole concept of algorithms. And I was, I was just listening to a podcast about um, you know, non-vaccinators and how suddenly all these non-vaccinating things were rising on everybody's feeds because of the fact that they were clicking on them to look at them, not that they agreed with them, but suddenly I, as a person, suddenly think that everybody wants to non-vaccinate, which isn't really true. But, um, but, it's that, it, but that's all algorithms based on, on social media that people aren't even involved with. So, so, so it's a, just a, it's like a game. I feel like I'm always playing a game. And then which social media platform do I most do I spend most of my time? I'm finding out more people are going on Instagram now than anything else. So now I have to like now I've got to get my images. And I'm a, a children's museum, so I use I use heartstrings constantly with my images, mm -hmm. which which is part of my design. Um, but I don't know. I it's just a, it's an intriguing world, you know that that we live in in that regard. But thank you for your comments, though. I've jotted yeah, down. Yeah, thank you. Yes. And I I think those are oh excuse me, <laughs> those are great comments too. Um, I I know Facebook has recently gotten in a lot of trouble for that. Um, you know, it, it, there are a lot of platforms that are getting in trouble for um, their the way they advertise. Um, I know Facebook has had a few. Um, uh, times where their advertisements were, um, they were extremely biased. Uh, there were a few job ads that they had too that were um, taken down because they were sexist. They were only uh, sending out these ads to like males in their 30s when women would be just as qualified. Um, and so I think that's definitely something you take into account. Um, but uh, we're, we're finding that platforms like Instagram are really um, vital for connecting with people. Twitter works great for us, um, as long as you have someone on it, you know, because things like Twitter, Instagram, not as much, but with Twitter, it's like there's so much interaction that has to happen for any audience to really gather that it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but Instagram, especially if you are um, trying to like tug at people's heartstrings, visuals would be great for that. So Instagram is a great outlet. Yeah, definitely agree. Do you have any advice on small businesses, for example, a clothing company building their brand or identity when they plan on being like a corporate thing later on? Yeah. So like the um, initial brand building and like identity building? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So there's a lot that goes into that. Um, but ultimately, a lot of that does start with um, word of mouth and getting people to actually connect things. So um, like she mentioned, social media is a great place for that. Um, a lot of people think it's because you can go viral. I wouldn't recommend trying to go viral. It's a terrible, you, you can't predict that basically and it's a wasted effort, but um, really investing in social media and word of mouth this early on can really build um, connections that can help you expand. Um, and if you also mentioned um, wanting to go for a, a much more professional um, uh, style, just make sure when you're posting things that they get a few extra sets of eyes, right? Um, if you're worried about people going on your uh, corporate page later and finding something really embarrassing, I would double check it now. Make sure you're not going too crazy with reaching out to that audience and make sure it's audience appropriate. So um, with a clothing company, I, I think that should be pretty easy to figure out who your audience is and then make sure, you know, you're creating content that would be relevant to people who are in your clothing. Does that help? Are you, would you like me to expand on that anymore? That was, that was good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, um, any other, any final questions? Thank you all so much for showing up and I really appreciate this discussion. You know, I want everyone to take away something that's really relevant to them and hopefully we've been able to do that today. So thank you all so much. And thank you for coming out. Thank you.